So what we want to talk about now is talking about differential amplifiers and in actually using them in ways that people may have been traditionally thought of, familiar with them is in a voltage input and a voltage output. And just to kind of talk about just qualitatively what you see in terms of the experiments and why certain choices are made. Now we've talked about a transistor with five transistors before in other places and obviously the whole differential pair in terms of the, the tanch like behavior you would get. We also have a current mirror which then reflects this current in and we could then use this as a voltage in, current out type of amplifier, which, should, which is really a, quite a very useful concept and formulation. But you might ask the question, what happens if I like don't have any sort of low impedance node here, unless I just disconnect this and measure it? What do I see? And what I would actually get is then a high gain amplifier out of this, where I'm looking at the differential input of what I'm putting here and I'm going to get an output voltage from that and there's going to be some high gain. It's still going to be this output current I plus, I minus together, and they're going to push up against the early effect. And so just like any sort of common source amplifier, I'm getting the same kind of behavior, the same kind of high gain region. And not terribly surprising, the gain I would get would actually be, you know, kappa V0 over 2UT. If I'd like to actually talk about it, it should be kappa over sigma, kappa over 2 sigma is also appropriate in times of differential voltage. And I'll get that in a particular region. Um, and so not surprising we would get that. But now there's a question of, let's get back to the sort of DC level of question. What happens to the overall behavior of the circuit? Because I could take the circuit and I could just start to power it up and say, let me do a voltage sweep. Let me hold the minus terminal at say 0.2 volts and sweep the input voltage from zero to five volts on this is an older process, for example. So, you know, we can run with a five volt supply. And what you get is you'll get this nice sort of curve. It'll kind of come up and be this blue curve. And you think, oh, okay. So I definitely see a nice high gain region here. Obviously, something else is off here. I don't know what that is, but we'll come back to that. But certainly, I get a nice region here with a reasonable gain. You wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise you to imagine that gain is maybe a hundred or a few hundred, um, just looking at it. And you think to yourself, this is a great, this is a great kind of circuit. I can do a lot of things with this. I can imagine building things where I compare between two voltages and it gives me a high voltage output. I can imagine building this as an amplifier and a feedback loop. All these things kind of make sense, right? Um, but clearly there's still this nagging problem of what's going on down here, but as most times when you do experimental work, you say, well, let's do some more measurements and maybe it'll just go away. Or maybe I just did, some, did something wrong, right? Or it's actually real and i got to think about it. Well, in this case, I actually have to think about it because then I go and I say, let me move this bias to three volts. And all of a sudden I realize I get a nice high gain region, but it this crept up on me. Ooh, that's a problem. Now what do I do? Hmm. Well, I'll put it up to four volts and see what happens. And it seems to creep up. And in fact, this is the four volt one. All of these seem to lie on top of each other and it becomes four volt. And you're like, my rate, I now I still have a high gain region, but it seems to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the question is why? You know, you're like, what's going on? And the core of this, one of the first things you notice when you look at the slope is the slope is kappa. And that always gives you an interesting indication of, you know, certain, certain values should give you an indication of what kind of circuits are going on. But even, and so you think maybe there's a source follower. And if you think about it in terms of the DC biasing between the plus and the minus inputs, say right about when they're equal, you know, if these are both equal, these are, don't worry about where the drain voltage is for the moment, you know, the voltage from here to here looks like a source follower. And in fact, when one of these is pulling most of the current, this voltage would set the source follower. If this one's pulling most of the current, this one sets, more, sets the source follower. And so it kind of gives you a sense that there's something about the biasing that causes an issue. And at a very simple level, what happens is, is that the movement of this output voltage gets impacted by the biasing of this differential pair. And when this output voltage gets below that point, which is being set by the biasing, it kind of gets stuck, right? It really doesn't doesn't go below that point to try to keep everything, at least keep some of the devices in saturation. And the thinking through the circuit is actually a really good one. And if you really want a good practice on circuit analysis and to kind of go, well, how do I think through this? And what's really limiting it? It's an excellent, excellent kind of exercise to work through. We talk about the circuit often, it goes by the name of the V-min effect because there's some minimum value. And for some circuits, this is a perfectly great topology because I don't need that lower, that part of that range. But for some circuits, I really do. So when I do, I'm kind of in this place where like, okay, now what? 
Well, what we often will use is this interesting circuit with the differential pair here, but now I use two current mirrors to, to mirror the current out. What am I doing? I'm effectively isolating the differential pair from what may happen afterwards on the circuit. And so as a result, then I actually current mirror this around, uh, just like I would have done, but now it's all flipped over. And I can always flip over N and P pretty much reasonably well in either of these cases. And so then I could push the two currents together and I get an output voltage as a result. Actually works pretty well. Um, and it's an interesting question when I look at the plus and the minus terminals, which ones are actually the plus and the minus terminals. And I actually left this a little ambiguous for the people looking at it. And you can kind of say, well, which one actually should it be? And it uh, makes for great test questions, by the way, uh, particularly objective test questions. So I'll leave that for, for, the, uh, for the viewer to, to actually verify, are those right or did I actually flip them? Hmm. Now, if you actually do the measurements with the circuit hooked up, you know, this being either correct or you corrected it for me, uh, this input voltage, if you now sweep it and you actually say, what does it look like a function output voltage? It literally looks like it's going you know, 2 volts, goes all the way through, 3 volts, 4 volts. Um, and this is exactly the operation you would expect. We will typically talk about this one as a 9 transistor amplifier or a wide output range amplifier. And for much of what we're going to often do, this is going to be the structure we're going to use. Uh, for, so for structures that we often build in configurable hardware, these are the amplifiers. This is the amplifier structure we typically have built into it. Um, and it, but it, you know, again, this can always change, and there's different ideas at different places. So what you can see is there's actually not just saying, hey, look, I've got a gain function here, but there's a lot of other richness to these circuits. And the more we can appreciate that, the more there's actually some interesting additional functions that, that we have available.